Uh, it is my pleasure uh, this morning to have with me from uh, Europe, Johan Nehrmann. Johan uh, is a uh, industrial designer, an architect um, from a, uh, I think, fairly renowned family that uh, did a lot of work on uh, light rail uh, transit in, uh, in Europe. And uh, his company has come up with a, a really interesting, different, uh, and I'm going to say innovative, um, urban transport vehicle for one of a better, I really don't, I can't, it's a trike, but it's not a trike. It's, it, it's really interesting. So we want to talk about that, and how that all came about and evolved. So uh, welcome to EV World, Johan. Hi, Bill. Nice to see you. It's, it's great to have you with us. Well, first of all, let's talk a little bit about uh, your background and, and, the, and the family, because this is a real contrast. You guys have done these big, heavy trains, basically, and done design work on those. And now we're talking about something that I'm guessing, I didn't see the weight specs on it, but I'm guessing it's probably only a couple hundred pounds. Um, oh, it's uh, even lighter than that. Even lighter I, than that. that frame will go between 35 kilogram to 75 kilogram with okay. all the batteries. Okay. But it's a very light vehicle versus what we did in the past indeed. Right. And okay. uh, you want to understand why we, we Yeah, we so how so how does how does one get from locomotives and subway cars and trams and funiculars to to something uh, in the nature of the uh, Johansson 3? Well, it's a question that basically points out to different answers. First, uh, it's not often that you have a family business that's passed on on the second generation. Right. So consequently, that has a different perception. Right. And secondly, thanks to my studies in the United States and system thinking, I was able to zoom out of the business and have a global uh, overview of what the future was uh, basically holding in terms of mobility in terms of finances, in terms of global issues. Right. Now, I understood in the early 90s when um, our office designed the most advanced tramway ever designed, which is the tramway of Strasbourg, because we came up with a lower floored vehicle from nose to nose at the same level as the platform, right. uh, which, which was called the Eurotram and which has been trying to be reproduced by several other uh, manufacturers and I had some patents with some even better vehicles later on. But I understood that the financial equation behind those tramways was basically not viable. That you needed at least 20 kilometers of track for a, a city with more than 250,000 people. Uh, we have yeah. seen many smaller cities taking on board this type of transport solutions to justify a company which at the end of the day, as you know, Alstom has been purchased over by a US firm. Yep. So I understood that very quickly and that basically everything would rest on the shoulder of the taxpayer and that basically the influence of imposing such heavy structures by uh, a well-negotiated coach cost between two or three million the coach is not that much but it will cost for the linear meter of track without electrification, yeah. uh, engineering costs, etc., etc. So I understood after having studied in the US or so that Europe was going to fail in the early 90s, and that the future of mobility was going to be in the hands of the individuals, if right. they wanted to make a difference for the planet, right. and consequently you had to provide them with a tool that was highly functional, cheap, but a real answer to the need. Or today, what is the real need in terms of mobility? It's the last mile. Right. Cities try to prevent you to get closer to where you want to be with your car. Yep. They want to put it somewhere where it's sleeping and it's paid for. That's a good equation. But, or you drive the car and it moves on and you have to respect the speed, or you're in the street and you take space and it's the, the, the worst scenario case for you because you don't know if your car is going to be, is going, is still going to be there, if it's going to be fine, and you have to move on. Yeah. So what are the tools available when you, uh, when you, have, you come out of the subway, you come out of a tramway, you come out of a station, you come out of a cab, well, you have your feet, or today you have two wheelers. Right. Not everyone wants to be on a two wheeler, not everyone wants to be sweaty, but some people want to be dressed the way they want. You want to have payload capacity, you want to be able to go to all the attractiveness spots of a city that makes it interesting. But if the city regulation prevents you from getting there and prevents your freedom of movement, they are in big. 
I would say, disequilibrium. And that's where we are today. And this is where a vehicle can be uh, purchased, can be leased, can be rented, can be used, and is a real great alternative at a very cheap solution. It's foldable, it's uh, dismountable, you can be, use it for a mini skirt, a jellaba, a sari, a kimono, or even a Scotsman. It means that it has a high seat position, and that basically it's the friend of the pedestrian. And it can go up to speeds up to uh, 50 kilometers per hour or 70 okay. miles. Uh, no, uh, 50 miles per hour, 70 kilometers per hour. Sorry. Right. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so so you've, you've gone then from this large thing, and, and the response to this, as I understand, the response to this is, in fact, number one, the cost of building, for example, light rail and, and, and tram systems, and, and that's becoming increasingly restrictive just simply because of the cost per kilometer. It is just, so what we need is something that is much more adaptable to an urban environment that people can use uh, on a on a uh, on a temporary basis to get as you say that that last mile then well i'm a system thinker by education now since i was in the united states and you know as well that the railway system or whatever network we create are rather static and in today's right. world where things move very fast you want something flexible easy that can be changed and adapt to your needs uh, the way the way you live Right. Uh, if you're going to move, you have kids, you have no kids, uh, you want to have an alternative solution that is uh, very different to what you use daily. Uh, do I have to buy another car? Do I have an alternative in between a bicycle and a car? Right. Why not having an in-between solution that I can use to, uh, in the garden, uh, do shopping, go for leisure, go golfing, uh, you know, something that is really a friendly little tool that you can use on a daily basis. And that's what's basically... Um, I, I spent my time designing for the last few years. Okay, so this started, as I understand it, looking at the websites, about uh, 2012, 2011 you started yes, working on yes, it? Yes, 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 yes. Uh, we created uh, 2011, 2012, yeah, the eyepieces uh, company and then the Johansson Tree Operational Manufacturing Company. Okay. Now, what we want to do is basically, we are able to reverse the process of cheap imports by just what's new today. It's not the fact of putting an electrification, an engine of a bike, that we have revolutionized the way of mobility. It's nothing. It's still a bike. Right. Uh, ladies still have to put a saddle in between their legs. They cannot wear a skirt. Uh, it's just, it's just not, not a social evolution. Um, now, the fact of putting it stable uh, is already a big plus, because it's what you need to have payload capacity. And, and that's what we are looking for, is basically added value. We are able to reverse the trend by saying stop cheap imports on Alibaba by buying discounts and pretending you're doing a design operation by putting stickers on it. We are able by thinking and using our brains to reverse the process and provide business models to improve mobility issues. Okay, all right. That's so, where so, I position myself. That's my dream. Right. See, let's stop putting people uh, producing and whatever conditions, cheap things that we're going to buy for whatever. An electric bike today is being produced at 160 euros, 200 USD from China. It yeah. hits a market at between 1,500 and 2,500 USD or euros. Where does all that money go? And when it comes to retail, it's a catastrophe. <laughs> yeah. Why? Because they have maybe five, seven, eight, ten brands under the roof. They cannot follow all these spare parts. Yeah, yeah. It doesn't work. So the guys basically spend his time repairing puncture tires and uh, breaking solution, etc. But it doesn't work out. So, so let's talk about the de the design. How how that evolved. I mean, obviously you started off. Well, help, help me. How did you start that? Because you know we think of of we have basically you got two choices. You have the bicycle, and then you have the tricycle. Um, and, and so you know, and, and I'm gathering you settled on that. Because of your background in ergonomics, I'm guessing that was what your yeah. thinking was. Let's make this as ergonomically practical for as many people as possible. Well, let me tell you the methodology uh, I use and I, I have uh, worked. Uh, work, I'm, I'm basically a system thinker and I, I, I use a, a very specific method, okay. which I integrate all kinds of parameters. So it's not that I needed three wheels. I needed to say it needs to be stable. Right. So okay. the question came, do we need two wheels, do we need four wheels, do we need five wheels, six wheels, or three wheels? Right. So it was obvious that three wheels was the right answer. Okay. Now, what is the configuration? 
Is it going to be the delta configuration or is it going to be the, the, the torpedo configuration? And uh, I realized very quickly for ergonomic uh, reasons and for cost price, the delta configuration was for us the most interesting because we were that frame would allow us to put three adults on one frame. Okay. And that another configuration would not allow us to do so and would be more heavy, more costly. So cost was the first parameter to in, in, in the part of the equation. Cost, okay. cost, cost. Then of course it was initial stability. Then of course it was optimized ergonomics and performances and added value towards interface man machine and the user which is a pedestrian. The first thing to do for moving in the morning is putting our socks and shoes. Right. Then when we go out, we put a jacket and then if you want to transport something, if we don't have a car, we have bags on the end of our hands or a backpack. Right. That's right. the basic. That's right. human. And, and if you want to move around and, and understand what you carry and what your daily basis is, you're a commuter, you're shopping, you have kids, the daily life, you want to create a tool that does it all. At this stage, we are working, for example, on accessories. I can tell you that we can put four baby seats for age three to five on our vehicle. Wow. If I, if I push it a bit, I can put five baby seats. Oh, wow. Amazing. Yeah. So, so this um, and uh, we are working on luggages, so we are basically, we want also to revolutionize the way we will be doing shopping in the future. Right, okay. I have to keep this confidential because it's going to be big too, right. as much as our vehicle is. Okay. So uh, our vehicle is a bit of a transformer. It didn't come out just by ingenuity, it came by work and by integrating functionality, knowing that the beauty of a car is its payload. It's a big volume. But it's the big volume we use because we like to grow in our car. Even if we drive it alone, we are able to put three, four, five adults, okay. plus the payload, the luggage, and everything we want on a weekend. That's right. the beauty of the car. Right. But it's conflictual when it comes into a narrow space.